Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are ready to start tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you to Paul Law, who is our guest tonight. Uh, welcome to uh, the second um, talk at Kuma International Architecture Month. Um, it's so good to see uh, a lot of people joining tonight. And hello also to all the people that are joining on Facebook. Uh, we are still letting some people in. So thank you, everyone who is connecting right now. Uh, my name is Claudia Zini, and I'm the director at Kuma International. And I'm really, really happy about uh, having you here tonight uh, with us. Um, first of all, uh, before starting, I would like to thank um, to thank a lot uh, all our donors and partners. And I would like to start with the, the Italian ambassador in Sarajevo, Nicola Minasi, and also uh, all the people at Open Society Fund, uh, our friends at Seven Academy, the Association of Architects in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which are actually hosting us tonight at, the, at their headquarters in Sarajevo, International Birch University, by book, and also Ideologia. So thank you so much to all of you. And uh, now I will leave the floor, um, still uh, admitting some people in. Thank you to all people joining us again. And uh, I'll leave the floor to uh, my colleague and friend, Leila. Um, she's the course leader for the architecture program at Kuma. And I would like Leila to say a few things before we start. Thank you so much, everyone. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us tonight. As Claudia said, this is um, our second lecture for this architecture month. Uh, and it's actually our second edition of an architectural program. So as we mentioned last time, um, the theme that we're exploring this month is um, architecture of resilience. And we're doing this in four subsections. We are talking um, this week with Paul Law, who will be addressing um, building resilience under destruction. We already heard from Armina last week, so Paul is continuing with this theme as well. Um, and uh, following that, next week we'll be talking about memory and resilience. So we'll have Anna Kukic and Sabina Tanovic with us and after which we will also be talking about resilience as culture and um, we will have Azra Akshamia and Amra Haji Mohamedovic talking about this theme and then finally uh, for the last week week four we will be discussing the divisions and resilience and we'll have Igor Kuvac and Msiha Pozder addressing this um, topic so as you can see we've prepared quite um, a lineup of speakers for you and we hope that you can join us uh, for you know as many lectures as possible and so we're also very, very happy to have Paul here with us tonight. So Paul was also here with us last year uh, for our kind of pilot, pilot architecture project. And now we're so happy that he's with us again. So Paul, um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I just want to say a few words about Paul, but Paul really deserves a whole uh, longer introduction, maybe a lecture in itself, because Paul is such um, he, he's, he's such a great um, person and such an, a chief photographer. He's an award-winning photographer whose work is represented by Pentos Pictures and who has been published in Time, Newsweek, Life, The Sunday Times, The Observer, and The Independent the independent among others so I mean his work speaks for itself but in addition to that he also teaches and he's the course director of the master's program in photojournalism and documentary photography at the London College of Communication uh, University of the Arts London um, and so tonight Paul will be discussing um, kind of architecture of resilience behind the camera because he did spend um, the entire siege of Sarajevo um, here. And so um, he has taken photographs um, of other conflicts as well. But uh, interestingly for us tonight, for, for the local context that Paul has actually spent and the, 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 some of the time, or most of the time of the siege here. So Paul, without further ado, I thank you once again and um, welcome. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to take you on a little bit of a journey through um, some of the things that I'm interested in as a photographer, but also as an academic and as a researcher. So before we come on to my work that I did during the siege here in Sarajevo, I wanted to reflect a little bit on the relationship between photography and ruins. 
So I think that's quite a relevant theme for, for this architectural um, project that we're working on. And, you know, photography, this is, you know, arguably the very first photograph ever taken. It's view from the window at La Grave by Joseph Nips, the French photographer, taken in 1826. Um, and so buildings and architecture and landscapes have been one of the most dominant themes of photography since literally the very first photograph. So I think it's very interesting to think about how photography has documented urban culture and change in cities. And, you know, cities are strange things, aren't they? Because they're very fluid and they change. And we and yet often we don't think of them as that. We think of them as kind of almost fixed when we when we see a city. So this is a picture taken by Frederick Martins of Paris in 1846. And again, extraordinary, very, very early photograph made of a composite of num numerous daguerreotypes. Um, one of the very first panoramic pictures ever taken. And this is a Paris that doesn't exist anymore. Um, because after this, in the 1870s, Paris was completely remodeled by Haussmann and all those sort of wide boulevards for moving troops around after the 1848 revolutions. So in a way, this is the only record we have of how Paris looked at that time. So I think it's very interesting to think about how photographs can take us back into the past and bring that past back into the present again and show us cultures and, and buildings and architecture and the shape and the form and the texture of cities that are no longer there uh, in many ways. So with that 1848 revolution, it was also one of the most, one of the earliest examples of what we now call aftermath photography. And this is when a photographer takes a photograph of what happened after the event, as well as what happens during it. So this is taken by a photograph, photographer called uh, Eugene Thibault, and it's the barricade in Rue saint maur before and after the attack during the 1848 revolution. And so on the left hand side there you can see the barricades and then shortly afterwards when the troops had come through and smashed those barricades up you can see the picture on the right and this is one of the very first pictures that was published in a newspaper although it wasn't an actual photograph that was published it was a drawing taken from the photograph obviously at that time but it was also one of the very first examples of what we might call photojournalism covering the dramatic events in the streets of paris um Photography really began to come of its own in the mid the late 19th century, once the glass plate camera allowed photographers to take images in the field more easily. And this is a picture of the ruins of the great uh, redoubt in Sevastopol by a Scottish photographer, James Robertson, taken during the Crimean War. And so ruins and the destruction wrought by conflict and the aesthetics of that destruction have again been one of the most powerful themes in photography. And I think even in this image of incredible devastation, there is still a strange form and logic and aesthetic in the composition of the image, but also in the shapes and the textures and the various different sort of objects there. And it's a peculiarly haunting image, I think, because it has this duality of horror, destruction, but also this strange kind of sculptural aesthetic quality. This is another picture from the 1850s, taken in 1858. It's the ruins of Sengdar Bach Palace in Lucknow, taken by an Italian British photographer called Felice Beato, who uh, was photographing shortly after the event, probably a month or two after the, uh, the uprising against the British had taken place in Lucknow and had been defeated or put down with great violence, obviously, by the British forces. And this obviously quite almost neo-colonial sort of um, almost kind of neo-Renaissance, neo, neo uh, grecian Roman temple was very badly destroyed and kind of taken from a contemporary modern building back into a ruin. And I think that's a really interesting way in which um, modern artillery, modern weapons can destroy a building very, very quickly and take it back to its, its ruined state. Extraordinary image, very again, very haunting. This is taken by one of the most famous photographers of the American Civil War, uh, and, um, uh, and it's of the Gallego Mills, which at the time was the largest flour mill in the world. And it was, it's in Richmond, uh, which was then the capital of the South of the Confederate States, which was captured by the Union forces and a huge fire consumed the whole kind of economic center of the town. And it's, again, incredibly uh, powerful image, incredible aesthetic, uh, almost looks like a sort of a, a, a incredible abstract drawing, sketchy sort of drawing, but it's a really powerful 
summary, I think, of the devastation that was caused by the by the American Civil War. Now, what I, felt, what I find very interesting about contemporary um, ruins of conflict is that they're almost always very quickly erased. So the Richmond was completely rebuilt after the American Civil War. These ruins were just flattened and demolished and a whole new town was rebuilt on top of them. So I think one of the interesting things about modern conflict and modern warfare is the ruin has become almost um, exercised or cut out of history, if you like. Because if you think about pre-modern warfare ruins, like uh, this painting in Poussin, they tend to be protected and renovated. So the Colosseum or the castles of, of Tudor England or the, um, or the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, abbeys of the, that were destroyed by the Tudors in the 15th, 16th century in Britain, we now consider them as very picturesque, romantic locations where we might go on holiday or we might go to visit them as a tourist site. But that's not the case with 20th century or 21st century ruins, typically. Normally they've been uh, destroyed, rebuilt, uh, forgotten, if you like. And then that's a very interesting question as to why do we think of one set of ruins as romantic and beautiful and having an aesthetic and another set as being something we simply want to build over and or even more often return to the state they were in before. So this is a series of pictures taken by a French, a Belgian photographer called Anthony of Ypres in Ypres, which was the uh, small town in northern Belgium that was one of the most fought, after, fought over battlefields of the First World War. And as you can see, the town, the medieval, beautiful medieval town was completely destroyed by the fighting. Now, Anthony had actually had his photographic business in E before the war. And he was, you know, essentially making tourist postcards for people who would come and visit these beautiful uh, historic buildings. So he had all these photographs from before the war. And he very meticulously went to the locations during the war of those same, uh, same images he'd made in the pre-war period and re-photographed the ruins. And then he made a set of postcards that had these two before and after views in them. Now, very interesting, he then, and then, he then sold those often to British uh, families who would come to look at the places where their sons had been killed, um, which is quite poignant. And he also documented how the bourgeois middle-class life of Belgium had been totally smashed and destroyed and ruined by, by the, the war. And you can see in this image of you know, a very posh uh, living room, probably of somebody's house full of beautiful furniture and art and culture totally destroyed by the violence. Now, interesting, Ypres was completely rebuilt. And if you go there now, you would never know there had been a conflict. The buildings, the medieval buildings were totally restored to perfection. So you would literally never know that, that the second war, the first war would ever happened if you went there today. And the same thing happened in Warsaw, for example, after the Second World War, when the Warsaw Ghetto and the central Warsaw was completely destroyed, it was rebuilt again um, in the same style. So the buildings still look like they're medieval or uh, 18th, 17th century, but in fact, they're actually completely modern reproductions. And this theme of the destruction of bourgeois life and the ruination of, of, of of the dreams and hopes of a generation it was continued by Robert Kappa in a picture that he took in, uh, in, in Barcelona, which is one of the very first cities to be attacked by aerial bombing in, in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. And again, this very poignant image of the total destruction of a, of a family's life and the family photograph on the wall, all that's left really of that, of that normality destroyed by the, by the attacking aircraft. Um, as I said, ruins be has always been a really powerful theme for photography. And I think one of the most extraordinary documentations of, of that process that I was just talking about are the images taken by Margaret Bourke White, uh, an American photojournalist who was working for Life magazine during the Second World War, who managed to um, get herself onto an American aerial reconnaissance plane that was flying over the uh, devastated cities of Germany that had been completely raised to the ground by the Allied bombing effects. And a lot of this was not, these cities were not fought over by soldiers in sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were deliberately destroyed by the Allied, the British and the American air forces to shatter the will to resist of the German nation and to destroy their civilian and their uh, economic and industrial infrastructure. 
And this town, you know, was completely rebuilt after the war. Again, its medieval center was restored and rebuilt. So this kind of horrible skeletal, but rather beautiful image um, is all we have left of the absolute devastation, the memory of what happened to that small town in Germany. So there are a few exceptions to that rule, however, and this is the Kaiser William Memorial Church, which is in the center of Berlin, which was also destroyed during the Second World War. And there was a really huge debate and discussion after the war about what should be done with it. And if anyone has been to Berlin, you will know that in the end, the decision was made to preserve part of the church, the ruins, and then build a very modern, brand new uh, annex to it. So it kind of mixed together the ruins, the, the ruins of this medieval church uh, destroyed by the allies and this new reinterpretation of, of an ecclesiastical uh, building. So it kind of tried to combine the two together in a sense of preserving the destroyed tower as a mark of the suffering that Berlin had undergone during the war, but then also having a new section that, that I guess spoke about the future and the building of a democratic uh, country in West Germany, because this is this was in, in what was, was West Berlin, obviously now is the unified capital of, of Germany. Um, and another theme that obviously we have to think about in terms of ruins is who lives in those ruins and the people that are people whose lives are ruined. This is a photograph by Gary Knight, uh, sorry, by Ron Haviv uh, from Seven, who many of you may know his work. And it's for me an extraordinary image because it's literally a negative of somebody's life. This, Ron took this picture in Kosovo in 1999 in a Kosovo Albanian uh, house where the family had been uh, cleansed by the Serbian forces who were trying to force out the ethnic Albanians from Kosovo. And they had executed uh, an old man, the grandfather of the family in the house and left his body on the floor and then set the house on fire. And eventually when the family came back to uh, reclaim their property after the Serbs had been forced out by, by NATO, they recovered the body. But what was left behind was this imprint of where the body had lain when the ash and the soot and the smoke from the fire had fallen on top of it. So it created this extraordinary legacy, as it were. And in terms of resilience and living with the past, uh, Gary Knight, who also photographed this, went back many years later to the same house to see what was happening to the family. And they pulled back the carpet in the living room and showed him that no matter how much they'd scrubbed the concrete floor of their house, they couldn't fully erase this extraordinary outline of their, of their grandfather that was lying embedded, literally embedded in the fabric of, the, of their floor. So that's, I guess, probably still there even to this day as a trace of that life that had been destroyed. This is uh, a picture from, um, by Simon Norfolk. And it was taken in Afghanistan in 2001 after the Taliban were forced out by the Americans. And his, his body of work there is called Chronotopia. And that's based on the Bakhtian idea of a chronotype. And a chronotype is a, a, a moment when time and space become kind of fused together. Uh, and it's a very sort of historical view, as it were, of how images, how physical spaces and images might operate. And so what Simon observed in this body of work that he did of the landscapes of the destroyed city of Kabul was that you can literally see the traces of the successive battles that were fought by different armies, by the Russians, by the Americans, by the Taliban, by the, um, by the other Afghan forces, because each successive battle has left its own set of unique marks on the liter literally on the fabric of the buildings that, that, uh, that are still there in the, in, the, in the city. And one of Simon's most famous pictures from that is this balloon cellar, which uh, against this extraordinary sort of what looks like Stonehenge or some kind of Neolithic uh, um, site the ruins of some kind of concrete structure and as we know concrete is actually an incredibly resilient material it takes a lot to destroy concrete so even when it's blown up and smashed up and just um, and hit multiple times it still kind of hangs together very often and obviously this symbol of this balloon cellar uh, in this beautiful morning light um, very reminiscent of Poussin and those landscapes that we looked at earlier that Simon very much acknowledges as part of his visual 
aesthetic repertoire. So just this symbol of, of resilience, I guess, against this incredible devastated building, which again still has a strange kind of beauty. I think that's one of the very interesting and kind of challenging things about ruins is that they do have this very powerful aesthetic. I think they do speak to us in, in, in strange ways about the, the nature um, of destruction and the nature of suffering. So uh, just to now to bring you to my own work, um, my own photography. So as, as Claudia uh, and Leda said, I, I came to Sarajevo in 1992 in June um, to photograph this, this extraordinary story of how the everyday people of the city uh, survived the siege and all of the sort of incredible strategies of survival that they developed um, to use to be able to get through that incredible dangerous period. Um, I did a book in 2005 called Bosnians, so I'm showing you some of the spreads from that book now. And one of the things that I did when I did the book was I asked uh, people to comment on the photographs that I'd taken at the time. So we had a public exhibition and I got people to write their comments onto pieces of paper next to the images. And so this bit of writing on the right hand side there that says to go or not to go, that is the question, Ichi ili neichi pitan sad, uh, was written specifically in response to this photograph you can see on the left. And what this shows is, uh, I guess it's a symbol of resilience in many ways. Um, it was taken in Alapash Nepolye, in the new town of the city of Sarajevo. For those of you who don't know that, Sarajevo has the old town center and then like a long ribbon that stretches out from there is the newer buildings that were built during the socialist period and the, and the for the Winter Olympics and so on. And during the war to protect people from shelling and sniper fire, these huge concrete slabs were put uh, up to provide some kind of cover. And this man is standing behind one of these big slabs, contemplating whether he's gonna run out into the open to try to cross a bit of ground to get to the other side. But in doing so, he's gonna to have to risk his life to potentially being shot by a sniper. So quite an extraordinary uh, uh, thing to be thinking about. Just imagine how it would feel to stand in relative safety with the thought of then, are you gonna to have to risk your life to run to the other side of the, of the street? So here's another one of those barriers that were put up. And I think one of the extraordinary uh, stories of, of the siege was how intelligent and how resourceful the citizens of the city were in finding numerous ways to try to protect themselves. So this was just obviously uh, sheeting from some fab factory probably uh, that was put up along the street uh, in Mariantvor that runs sort of from the center towards the Eunice Towers and the Holiday Inn. I think it's just above the Hastahana Park, which is the playground, uh, which is a playground today, and um, provided some kind of uh, visible shelter or, or barrier to the sniper fire. On the right hand side is a, an elderly man uh, who is surveying the damage that a shell had just done to falling through the roof of his house there. So this is another example uh, of what I talked about before of those concrete, um, those concrete slabs. So, but, but taken to another level, I guess. So you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, those concrete slabs protecting the, the, the buildings below and the walkways below from snipers and from shelling. But above that, you can see this woman who created this extraordinary vegetable garden on the roof of the apartment building, uh, again in, in Alipash Napolia, I think, or it might even be Dobrini, this one. Um, and she'd created this incredible sort of vegetable patch, which she would water every day. And you can also see in the background there, the UNHCR plastic sheeting that was such a, a symbol. Obviously lots of people's windows were destroyed by shelling and mortars. And this, this UNHCR sheeting became one of the great symbols and one of the most useful materials during the siege. People used it for all sorts of things to create um, uh, barriers to, to block up windows, obviously that have been destroyed, to, to create makeshift structures, greenhouses, things like that. And on the right hand side here, you can see a, an area that was a park or um, in the middle of the city that had been that was being turned into a vegetable patch again, the pe for people to grow food and to um, to grow crops and so on. This was quite early on in the war, uh, in the early part, 
when people were just realizing that this was going to go on for a long time and what they thought was perhaps going to be over very quickly was actually settling in for something that was probably going to last years and so they began to realize they were going to have to find ways to grow food to survive and all these urban sort of citizens of the city suddenly became gardeners and farmers and vegetable growers and so it was an incredible sort of um, shift as it were from one form of life to another. So this is a series of pictures of the bridge uh, that runs across uh, from the bottom of Strossmeyer uh, Avenue across the river Miatska, which people had to cross every day in order to um, get water from uh, a standpipe. Because obviously during the siege, as, as many of you will know, there was no water, there was no electricity, there was no gas uh, most of the time. And so there was no running water most of the time in people's apartments. So people had to move uh, to wherever the nearest standpipe was to gather water in buckets, in containers, in whatever they could find. And obviously, you know, water is a very precious commodity and, and we need a lot of it to survive. We need it to drink, to cook, to wash. And the average person in the West uses liters and liters and liters of water every day without even thinking about it. But obviously one liter of water weighs one kilo. So trying to carry 10, 15, 20 liters for a family means you're carrying a lot of weight, especially when you're very tired and hungry and undernourished from the relentless uh, days of the siege. So one of the things that really fascinated me um, as a photographer was all the extraordinary ways in which people found ways to survive. Um, all these different little carts that you can see that people built to transport this food and water and wood, the way they chopped down trees and, and railway sleepers, um, the way they queued for water. Um, you can see there in one of those pictures, the bottom uh, in the bottom left hand side, the, the left hand side of the image there, the bottom side there, if you can see it, there is a man who built his own hydroelectric power station out of old radiators and bits of old generators. And it was enough to charge a battery every night so he could, he could listen, he could sit and read the newspaper, Oslobogeli, that was still being printed even in the middle of the war. And also on the right hand side of the page there in the middle of that grid of images, you can hopefully see um, a woman there pointing a rifle out of the window. In fact, that's one of the very few pictures I have of anybody shooting in the book that I did. She's actually shooting an air rifle at pigeons out of her window and she would catch the pigeons, kill the pigeons and then make pigeon pie from them. So I was really fascinated by this, um, this incredible ingenuity of people. And I wanted to show in the book how this was a very repetitive process and the scale of it, which is why I chose to lay them out in this kind of grid of images that shows you how all the, in all these different ways people tried to survive the siege. And obviously, one of the strange things about sieges uh, like this is that, uh, you know, like a lot of combat, a lot of warfare, there are obviously moments of very high intensity and incredible violence and fear. But also there are very long periods of just nothingness, just everyday boredom, just ordinary getting through the day. And so I also wanted to capture some of that sense of resilience, if you like, because how do you? get through each day. And obviously family was very important, friends were very important, uh, playing games was, became important. So you can see on the left here, this old man is playing chess in the hallway of an apartment building in the center. And on the right, you can see a family who would normally be gathered around the television watching TV, obviously, but given there was no electricity, that obviously is impossible. So instead they're sitting and talking in this rather beautiful uh, uh, apartment with this incredible sort of bourgeois set of paintings on the wall again. And what was also extraordinary is how even at the, in the middle of the war, when there was a ceasefire, people would go out and they would swim and they would wash their clothes in the river Miatska in the center of the, of the city there. So this was taken in the summer of 1994 when there was a ceasefire and people were able to go out and swim. And it looks a very idyllic scene as if people were on holiday on the seaside or something. But in fact, you know, where they were here, they were in full view of the Serbian um, forces and who could easily have attacked them if they would so wanted to. And in fact, there were many moments, many documented cases during the ceasefires 
when attacks were mounted um, and lots of people were wounded and killed, sadly. So um, just moving on now to probably the most relevant set of images for what we're talking about today in terms of the of, of, of architecture. Um, I, I've only showed you a tiny sample there of the work that I did as a photojournalist, if you like, during the war. I obviously photographed the hospitals and the, the wounded and the front lines and a lot on culture and art and so on. But after two years of coming backwards and forwards, and I would, I would come into the city, fly in on a Hercules or find a way to drive in through the front lines, I would maybe spend a couple of weeks or a month or two months sometimes working here, photographing, then I would go back, I'll leave the city, go back uh, home to the UK, very often go off and cover another story. I think as, as, as uh, Leila said, I photographed in Grozny and Somalia and Rwanda and so on at the same time as the siege of Sarajevo was taking place. Um, but I realized at a certain point that that sort of conventional reportage, uh, 35 millimeter photography was only telling part of the story. And in fact, I found it actually quite hard to make pictures because I'd been to the hospital so many times. I'd photographed daily life so much that I almost couldn't see photographs anymore. And I was really struck by the actual fabric, as it were, of the architecture, of the layout, of the geography, the topography of the city. And so I decided to come on one trip in the winter of 1994 and 1995 with a very large format panoramic camera and also a square format Hasselblad camera, which we'll see images in a moment. And I decided to make a document of the architectural fabric of the city and also the way in which this very high intensity conflict using modern weapons had destroyed and damaged and marked the buildings of the city. Because I found that a really fascinating uh, aesthetically, actually, to be honest, as well as politically, culturally, socially, if you like. And I thought it was a really important thing to document um, because I assumed that after the war, the city would be rebuilt and these traces would disappear, which most, in most cases that has happened, but in some cases, obviously it hasn't. So this, many of you who are from uh, Sarajevo, from Bosnia will recognize the view taken from just above Ben Basha, looking down over the city. You can see in the middle of the frame there, you can see the river, Milatska and the bridges, and you can also see the, um, the um, ruins of the National Library, Vietnica, and you can see in the very far distance the Yunus Towers. And this image is taken not from a front line, but relatively close to a front line. And so you can see how open and how defenseless the city was really for, to the forces encircling it in the hills above and how they could see pretty much everything that was going on down there. This was taken uh, on the front lines uh, near Dobrynya, looking out across to the airport. So you can see Mount Igman in the background there, and you can see uh, some of the airport village and some of those small houses that sort of line the airport. And on the left-hand side there, you can see part of one of the uh, Dobrynya buildings, the apartment buildings there that were built for the 1984 Winter Olympics. And I remember when, when I was taking these pictures, looking at these uh, apartment buildings and thinking, my God, you know, they're completely destroyed. They are just gonna have to be demolished after the war and uh, flattened and rebuilt from scratch. But in fact, as I'm sure many of you will know, in fact, I was just in Dobrynya now before I came to do this talk because we had to go and visit a, uh, a doctor there for my son. And uh, they're completely rebuilt. You would never, I mean, with some exceptions, obviously you can still see some traces on some of the buildings, but on many of the apartment buildings there, they've been totally renovated and, re and restored. So again, a testament, I guess, to the resilience of concrete, um, that these buildings were able to be rebuilt after the war. So here's another example of one of those barricades. Uh, this time, two trucks and some containers were used, uh, and then these large concrete slabs to create a sort of bulletproof uh, shrapnel proof barrier and again I think this was on the outskirts of Dobrynya in the background there you can see one of the apartment buildings um, and obviously you know as always people put graffiti on it they start to leave their mark Aida, Sandra, Selma, Neshko, Gio, Zio sorry. I always love the the rather casual 
sort of guy that in, in military fatigues there sort of leaning against the tire. Again, this is shot through one of those barricades, uh, which was made of old cars and concrete, looking out across towards the airport and Mount Igman in that crack through the, uh, through the view there. This is a picture shot from inside of a shipping container, uh, looking out. It had been hit by shrapnel or an RPG or something, creating this incredible kind of pattern, almost like stars. And I got inside the container and photographed as people walked past through the, uh, to see them through the window. Sorry, not through the window, through the holes in the, in the shipping container. So for me, photography is a lot about traces. And I think um, Susan Sontag, the critic, the American writer, uh, famously said that photographs don't narrate. And I would actually take, uh, I take her up on that. I think photographs do tell stories. I think they do narrate. And I think in some ways this picture has a narration in it because you can see, obviously this was taken, uh, I think in the back of uh, Obola, the, uh, the uh, art, uh, sorry, the uh, theater academy in the center of the city uh, where a lot of uh, bullet holes had ripped into a wall. And you can see obviously these young people before the war had written their names onto the wall and then in, in successive layers. So you can see how each generation of kids, I guess, that played in that, in that, in that playground area, it was a basketball court, I think, had written their name, they tagged themselves on the wall. And then after that, the war came and punched all of these holes through those layers. So for me, this is very much returning to that idea we talked about early on of the chronotype of, of an image where time and space are kind of fused together. So these multiple layers of time can be read here in this image of all these lives, these young lives, many of which probably were killed or wounded or left or forced out as refugees. Um, and so you can see that, that literally embedded in the fabric of, the store of this image is the, the visible passage of time. This is a building that doesn't exist anymore. This is in Mariendvor. I think it's basically where the SCC shopping center is now. This is the brick factory, the famous brick factory um, in Mariendvor. And again, I found this to have a very strange aesthetic, the ruins of this building to have a very peculiar ghostly kind of quality to them, quite sculptural. And uh, when I was making this work, it was constantly making me think of a lot of sort of conceptual fine artists and things like the Tate turbine hall and these incredible kind of gallery spaces that we see. Uh, so this is this kind of unconscious artwork almost of destruction. And very obviously the, the Vietschitze, the interior of the National Library, which I think it's very interesting that obviously now it has been completely restored to its former glory. But whenever I go there now, I obviously have to celebrate that. But I also have a slightly strange feeling because there was something, there was a terrible and awesome beauty to the ruins that had a very, very strange character. And I almost wish that they'd kept perhaps one of those pillars inside the, uh, the, the building there as a monument to how it had looked after the fire. And that's potentially an interesting theme that I guess you'll be picking up on in some of the later sessions that you're gonna be having is what should we preserve of the past? What should we save of destruction? Should we create monuments from these destroyed buildings or should we simply bulldoze them and start from scratch? Welcome to the hell, but somebody scratched it out and written the name Sandler over that. Again, the interior of the, um, of the National Library. This is taken in the Lion Cemetery. Uh, these are the graves of um, quite often unknown children. Uh, you can see just two, two children there. And NN, when it says it means no name, uh, unknown graves. So the ones that don't have names on were all people that had died without being identified. And you can see how closely packed those bodies were. And this is Bashasha. This is the Sebi in the center of the city taken during the war. A uh, very different scene now, obviously. Uh, but um, you, know, you can see at that time, very, very quiet, but still very strangely beautiful.
So coming on to the, so as I said, I, I shot with this large format panoramic camera to give that expansive view. But then I also found, I also thought there were a lot of really interesting details and sort of little um, moments that I wanted to capture. So I worked also with a, a Hasselblad medium format camera. And this is taken in Hrasno of a sniper screen uh, that was draped across between two buildings to prevent the field of vision. So obviously, you know, from a sniper, you can create a bulletproof screen, but you can also just block their line of sight. So if a sniper can't see you, then they can't hit you. Obviously, this is no defense against shelling or mortars or shrapnel, but it will prevent you being shot by a sniper. So you can see here, you know, people sitting out on little chairs they brought out in the in the street there in the background, um, protected from the enemy vision by this screen of cloth. And here's another version again made with that UNHCR sheeting. This was a sniper screen on the edges of Dobrynya. This man had strung between two uh, poles to provide some kind of protection to the houses behind from the sights of the telescopic sights of the Serbian snipers and, and, and gunners. This is uh, outside of the Holiday Inn. Uh, or pass the zone, run or RIP, so danger zone, run or, or die, effectively. And the Holiday Inn obviously was one of those crucial buildings in the war, um, which served as a sort of unofficial headquarters for many of the journalists that were here, particularly the, the first two years of the war, um, who came here and set it, would, would use it as a sort of fortress base in the center of the city from which they could go out to do their stories, because it was kind of like a castle uh, in the center of the city, um, which most of the time the Serbs uh, allowed to exist. They did attack it on several occasions and it was fired, shot, you know, set, hit with incendiary bombs once and certainly plenty of people were shot in and around the hotel. But in general, the Serbs allowed the journalists to continue living and working there. A detail of a shell hole. So I was really fascinated by as I said, this strange aesthetic of destruction, the way that these very powerful and very destructive weapons create these extraordinary patterns on the physical texture, the physical fabric of concrete, stone, brick, mud. And also I was very fascinated by the, uh, all the different ways that the citizens of the city had created barricades and impromptu defenses using cars and uh, sandbags and plastic sheeting and so on to try to provide some sort of uh, protection against the attacks. So when I'm, I remember seeing, I distinctly remember uh, making this picture uh, in 1994, it's taken just behind um, the Holiday Inn in that area, uh, around those apartment buildings behind the hotel there. And when I, when I was making the picture, I very clearly remember thinking, somebody designed this, um, somebody built this carefully, because it's so precisely organized, the way that these cars were so neatly stacked on top of each other, and the sandbags were so well, well aligned. And in a way, it's like a microcosm of Yugoslav car history. Pretty much every model of Yugoslav car, Golfs and Zastavas and Fichos are all sort of piled up there. And Renault, the Renault 4 uh, is all piled up there in a kind of strange sculpture. And so I remember at the time thinking somebody who was really OCD or kind of a, you know obsessive compulsive disorder almost had built this barricade. But obviously I didn't know who'd, who'd made it. And then Two or three years ago, uh, I was giving a talk at a workshop we ran with Armina Pilav, who some of you will have heard talk on Tuesday at the Historical Museum. And she'd invited um, uh, um, Nisad Cengic, I think that's, I hope I've got his first name right there, who's an architect, quite a well-known architect, who was obviously here during the war. And he started to give a talk about his wartime experiences. And he explained that he was a young architecture student at the beginning of the war. And he'd volunteered for the local uh, civil defense force for the Opstina of the city that he lived in. And part of his job was to visit buildings that had been destroyed or hit by shellfire 
and work out whether they were still habitable and wh what resources the inhabitants might need to rebuild plastic sheeting or wood or glass or whatever. So part of his job was as a civil defense volunteer was to do that, but also part of his job was to build barricades. And he showed a photograph of this barricade. So I realized that he'd actually designed it. And he is a very precise and very organized and very careful architect. So this is, as they say, an architect designed barricade, which I, I find rather amusing, sadly, in the, in the end. Uh, here is the way that cars were used on in the outskirts of Dobrynya to create, again, a barricade uh, to, to, to uh, prevent snipers being able to see people and provide a kind of relatively safe route to move between different parts of the, of the town. This is a trench, a communication trench, again, on the edges of Dobrynya, which again, had filled up with water. This is the um, Vietnica, the museum. And obviously it's incredibly valuable priceless collection of statuary and monuments from the Middle Ages had to be protected. So they've been sandbagged, uh, had these sort of structures built around them and then had sandbags put around them to try to protect them because the, the museum was obviously very much on the very, very front line of the conflict. This is the bridge across from Gerbevica. And this was actually built by the French. These are UN barricades that were built. You can see a French soldier there on the right hand side. And even in the destruction, everyday life goes on. So people use this ruined building to hang up their laundry, beautiful, you know, macazars and pillowcases and hand embroidered pillowcases and so on. Very symbolic symbol of resilience, I guess. Another view of Yechitsa with the destroyed cars in front of it. Uh, the Oslobogenia building still sadly now destroyed. This is a good example, I suppose, of what we're talking about. You know, should you have tried to preserve in some way this building as an incredible monument? Because it was a very powerful symbol for a long time of the siege, both physically, structurally, as a sculpture almost, and also the, the newspaper itself, Oslobogenia, because it was the the main newspaper during the siege and it's the story of the survival and its production during the period was so 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 much a metaphor for the survival of the city itself. Again Dobrynya and obviously the Sarajevo roses that still um, are all over the city as you walk through the streets of Sarajevo you will still see many of the these, um, these shell shell uh, holes uh, embedded in the fabric of the floor. Another one of those images that I think for me really talks about the passage of time embedded into the image. You can see here, you know, the, the wall, the graffiti, the anarchist graffiti, the, the, uh, the um, sandbags that were then built and the way those sandbags have been literally torn to shreds by repeated impacts from shells and grenades and bullets, creating again a very strangely, um, strangely beautiful picture for my for me it's a very strange way in which those fabrics have been torn and shredded in a in a peculiarly aesthetic way i would argue and again this is in that brick factory in mariendvor and when i when i took this i distinctly remember thinking about a sort of klaus oldberg uh, sculpture or some kind of modernist uh, sculpture here of raw iron and metal the way that the heat had bent these huge metal girders when the building had burnt down, creating this extraordinary kind of sculptural, almost monumental feel. And again, looking up from, from Vietchitsa towards the ceiling, the cupola, which again now has been totally restored, but at that time was, was again, I would argue, strangely, hauntingly beautiful in its aesthetic. And this was, you know, I remember taking this picture thinking this looks like some kind of strange, extraordinary sculpture and in fact, it's just the ruined uh, car that had been hit by shrapnel, but it has this strange kind of animistic head, almost like ruined robotic sort of head. So finally, just in terms of resilience, <coughs> as I said earlier on, you know, much of the landscape of Bosnia has been rebuilt. This is a picture taken in Mostar. I think if you went back there now, the buildings on the right probably have been restored, but the building on the left hand side was completely destroyed and looked like the one on the right but had been very carefully renovated and restored 
This was taken in the early 2000s, I think, when the city was being rebuilt. Um, so it is a symbol that that rebuilding uh, is, is possible, obviously. Um, but finally, I think one of the saddest symbols of the war, which is still there, anybody that drives through Bosnia and crosses between the Federation and Republic of Srpska will still see these faceless, <coughs> sorry, these faces, as it were, of abandoned houses that were destroyed, often blown up at the very end of the war when the Serbs who had captured those areas realized that the families might, want, might one day try to come back to reclaim them and therefore blew them up to prevent people coming back. And these, are, these images were taken along the Drina Valley and also on the road between Doboj and Derventa and the border with Slavonsky Brod. And I think, I, I'm sure those of you that have driven through Bosnia will be very familiar with the way that these, these eyes still gaze on us decades later as a very powerful symbol of, sadly, the destruction and the legacy of the conflict that is still very much present with us uh, today. So that's the end of my talk. Um, very happy to perhaps take some questions if we still have a little bit of time. I guess we have about 10 minutes probably. Um, hope that was interesting for you. And um, yeah, please do feel free to ask any questions or if anybody has any wants to put any questions in the chat, please feel free. So we'll open up the floor to the audience. Um, if anyone has a question, you, you may ask, or perhaps if you feel more comfortable, you can also type it. Um, into the chat and we can uh, read it out loud. But thank you for Paul for a very inspiring yes. talk. It's just so good to um, thank you to listen to all of it and to look at your pictures. Um, is there a question? Is there any question from the from the audience? Uh, I don't have a question. But I do have a comment, if that's okay. Yes. We'll just, uh, uh, I would just, I would just like would you... to um, say that this lecture was really, uh, really interesting, and it was prepared in such a, I would say, visual way that it would, it, it clearly communicated the message, and I found it really interesting to listen to, and it was really fascinating. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you. Are you, are you an architecture, are you an architect or an architecture student yourself? Uh, yes, I'm an architecture student, actually, from Professor Leila. Yes. Great, great. Okay, very good, very good. Well, what I would what I would say to you as architecture students is, um, you know, one of the things I try to do is to help people start to think about using photographs not just as descriptive uh, objects that tell you what something looks like, as it were, but actually to think about them as um, symbols and metaphors and stories, and think about how you can use the photograph. As, a, as an entry point into something, as a way to think with and through. So rather than just showing what something looks like, use it as a space that you can begin to ask questions around and think about and try to use as a sort of a way to interrogate the past as well as the present. So I think that's one of the kind of things that I'm trying, often try to do with, with work when I'm working with people uh, is to begin to try and help them think about how an image is more than just a description of what's in front of the camera. It can be a lot more powerful and a lot more resonant than that. We have, um, thank, thank you, Paul. Yes, Actually, that's... Just, just to kind of, um, before we read the next question, uh, as you were saying um, about, you know, using photography, not just as a, perhaps a documentary source, right? But as conveying a certain message. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wanted to just briefly read one sentence from the publication, from our publication, where, which you have contributed to, and we wanted to thank you very much for doing of course. that. So um, Val Williams actually wrote an essay in which he says, uh, laws panoramas are a reverse of these 19th century creations. Architecture ruined, urbanity collapsed. They are a comment on the very fragility of sophisticated society. Right, so I find that very powerful and also this notion of the relationship between fragility and resilience, right? Because from uh, moments of fragility also arise like these moments of resilience, which mm -hmm. 
kind of talking about and and discussing today. And so also the your your photographs, in my opinion, are, are somehow a testament to both the fragility and the resilience that comes out of it. So I, I just wanted to add that. And not to take any more time, we have a second question. Yes, I can see that. Okay, so I'll try to answer uh, Amil's question and then Werner's. And good day. Oh, nice to see Amil. My son is called Amil, so I don't see Amil's very often, but nice to hear from you, Amil. Um, Sorry, Paul, maybe I can read the question out I loud. I think Paul can see the question. Yeah, I can see the question, so I, I can read it out. So Amil's <laughs> asked, uh, what do you think Sarah would look like today if no war had happened? Um, that's a very interesting, very difficult question to answer because you would then have to talk about whether Yugoslavia still existed and whether you know the Federation and Republic of Serbska existed and so on. So there's a whole set of obviously political, social, economic questions that that then raises. And obviously the, the, um, the, uh, the corruption in many ways and all the kind of land ownership questions that the war created would also be potentially part of that. So I think I can't answer that question directly but what I can say, I think, is one of the great tragedies of the city is that I think it failed to actually rebuild itself after the war in any kind of sensible, conscious way. I think, you know, there was a moment on when potentially Sarajevo could have been rebuilt in a, in a completely new way, in a way that would have created a, a much more stronger sense of public commons that hadn't been, you know, done purely for commercial predominantly for commercial gain um, and so on and so forth. Now, whether that would have happened if there hadn't been a war is also, I guess, very questionable. But I think that is for me, you know, as a citizen of the city, one of the great tragedies of the post-war period is that we didn't get a, a new city that was really worthy of, of what it could have been. Um, most of the developments that have happened, you know, don't really have any sense of continuity or any sense of building a livable, city that people would you know could actually make the most of which Sarajevo has that incredible potential but sadly I think it's been it's been um it really hasn't been realized since the war potentially it's still there there's still moments where you can see where things could be done that would be much more uh around kind of building that civic sense as it were but sadly so far I don't think that's really happened uh, so we've got a question from Werner Kashevich and also from Marisa, which is, they're both asking more or less the same question, which is, how did photographers keep safe during the siege? And what facilities do you have to keep equipment safe, meet each other and print photographs? And how you went moving around with any special rules for journalists? Um, well, I have to say, when we first arrived, we were quite naive. Um, it was obviously incredibly dangerous, um, but we came in soft cars with very little protection. Um, as the war progressed, and sadly, largely a result of casualties um, on the journalistic side, as well, obviously, on the civilian population of the city, we did begin to get better equipment, armoured cars, helmets, black jackets, and so on. Um, and we began to be a bit more aware of which parts of the city you could move around in and when and how. Um, but I'm sure there were times when I was out on the streets without knowing it was potentially in the sights of a sniper. And obviously with shelling, with mortars, with grenades, you literally never knew, you know, you were never safe completely because, you know, there was no warning for that happening. So, you know, you do build up a little bit of a knowledge of how to move around the city, how to physically occupy and move in a city that's under attack, you know, don't go out in the open, stay close to buildings, you know, find doorways to hide in all the time. You know, you're always looking around yourself for where you might find some cover if something did happen. Um, but, you know, it was always very dangerous and there were no, there was no special rules as it were, uh, or advantage for journalists, but we did have sometimes, not always, but particularly the, 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 the TV crews and some of the TV and some of the wire agencies did have armored cars. So for example, I would quite often um, I would quite often hitch a ride with somebody else from Reuters, for example, who had an armored car and drive around with them for a bit of safety. Um, in terms of printing, and I, I personally very rarely processed my film during the war in situ, although I did do that sometimes. Most of the time I would either take my film back out with me again or send it out on a plane with, uh, with a fellow journalist. But the AP and the uh, Associated Press and Reuters did 
you know, they built sort of temporary dark rooms in the bathroom. So the hotel, the holiday in bathroom, for example, would have been set up with processing tanks and chemicals and a hairdryer because they would have to process their film because this is before the digital age, obviously. So before we had digital cameras. And so you would process the film in the bathroom and then put it into a, a, a Hasselblad scanner that in those days would make a 300 kilobyte scan. Imagine that today. 300K, not, not megabytes or byte, but 300K scan that would take 45 minutes to transmit over a telephone modem or over a sat phone. Uh, Mirella asking a pin how the siege ruins of Saudi should be treated today as monuments or in some other mass uh, lecture, like some other manner, and Aydin, Aydin saying about how the city's being rebuilt after the war. So, yes, I think I. I feel like something should have been preserved. I think some of the ruins, I mean, which ones I don't specifically know. As I said, I think in a way it would have been quite interesting if they'd kept one column, for example, inside of Yechitsa um, as a symbol. I mean, they have obviously kept things like some of the Sarajevo roses are, are still being preserved in some ways. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it would have been interesting if they perhaps kept a couple of buildings near the front line in Dobrinja, for example, as monuments almost. But Again, all the questions of ownership and, and who's responsible for these things, I think, made it extremely complicated to do that. So, um, yeah. I won't, read, I won't read out Azra's comment. Maybe one of you could read that out because it's sort of quite, quite uh, supported. Perhaps we could finish yes. the question that we're coming towards the end. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. I'll just read Azra's comment. So Azra said, I would also like to add thank you for this, for this amazing presentation and explanation of the photographs in your vision. It was a pleasure listening to your points and ways of seeing objects and their beauty. Can't imagine the amount of bravery that you possess. Picture really does speak a thousand words. Thank you once again. So thank you, Azra. I think that's a great uh, kind of point Beautiful and a comment, comment. Yeah. to, to and tonight's yeah. lecture and uh, thank you paul so much for taking the time to be with with us tonight and for this amazing uh, lecture and also thank you to all of our facebook and um zoom participants absolutely and... i just well, want to... so go on claudia go on. no i just wanted to add that it's so um that i'm really happy we are of course we're doing this but it's a month dedicated to architecture and then we invited you as a photographer. And I think also seeing like the questions that we got in the comments, that it's really great. We are of course integrating the two disciplines and um, this approach, this multidisciplinary approach that we are trying to have here at Kuma. It looks like tonight, especially it's working very well. So um, really thank you again for the, for the lecture. Thank you, Leila, uh, for putting up such a, a great uh, program. Um, and Claudia for the support. And I mean, we are, we're, we're really, really happy. And uh, so thank you, well, Paul, again. Thank you. If anyone else has uh, any other questions, but I don't see them. Yeah. I mean, well, th thank you both very much. Thank you, Azra, for that uh, very sweet comment. Thank, thank you, Vernas, there for your comment as well there. And obviously, thank you very much to Kuma. It's an incredible job that you're doing. Really wonderful that you're keeping this going despite the situation we're in and uh, very very happy to be here and hopefully be back again in the future with you but well done and um, great to connect with everybody out there thank you very much for your attention um, you know if you are interested in ever following up with me I'm, I'm very you know I live in Sarajevo so uh, I'm very interested in talking to people if you want to follow up and ask me anything about the work um, be very interested to talk to you about that in the future so thank you very very much everybody okay Thank you so much then to Paul and everyone else. Um, thank you. So we'll see uh, we'll see you again uh, hopefully next week on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. We have Anna yes. Kukic on uh, on the program, and she will be talking about uh, memory resi resilience and memories. So stay tuned, stay with us, and um, see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so. Much. Thank you. Bye now. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. And see you soon.